So I figured something out and I don't like it. Yeah? All right. Yesterday, after work, had nothing to do. Yeah. Plenty of time to write. Okay. Hours, hours. At five, six hours minimum. Yes. Got home from work. I, uh, you know, showered and ate and all that stuff. And I was, again, just tired like I normally am for work and I from work and I just kept putting it off. I was like, oh, I'll write in a little bit. Maybe I'll get some reading done. Maybe I'll uh, just relax for a minute. Never got to writing, but I made a decision. Yeah. It was like 7.30, and I said, by God, I'm done with this life. Yeah. I am no longer being procrastinator Caleb. Okay. But I will keep being that if I just keep trying to make myself right after work. So I'm going to bed early. Okay. Mindy wasn't even home from work yet, and I was in bed. I went to bed 7.30. Well, I was reading. Yeah. I'll get on that in a minute. But I was reading until I, because seventh, I fucking normally go to bed like midnight. So, mm-hmm. but I was like, I'm gonna wake up early. I'm gonna wake up at five o'clock in the morning and write then. Okay. I'm gonna be that guy now. Maybe that'll work out better for me. So you have you tried that yet, or is that just the- this is this is the plan for this morning? So last night, like I said, I went to bed seven thirty ish, eight o'clock. Read till about ten, ten. Nah, yeah, I would say about ten. Maybe 9.30, I'm not sure, I didn't look at the clock, but I know it was around 9.30, 10 o'clock, finally went to sleep, woke up at 5 to turn my alarm off, went back to sleep, woke up at 6, but I made myself get up, well, it was a little before 6, but I made myself get up, and I showered, and, you know, I I got ready for work, and I ate breakfast and everything. My plan was originally to wake up at 5 and not do any of that till later, like just go straight to writing. I was going to say, what time do you... I normally, well, I leave about... 15 minutes to 8. And you gotta be at work around like 8? Yeah, I gotta be at work at 8, so it only takes me like 15 minutes to get there. And I don't really care about being early or even on time anymore, yeah. so. But I uh, decided, you know, I was gonna wake up at 5, but I didn't do that, but, but you know, it's baby steps. But I did get, made myself get up 6, 8 and everything, so it was about 6.30 when I had just nothing but free time, and I always do my language learning stuff before I go to work, like at least try to get some of them knocked out, I've been doing that lately. So I did all that, and I still had uh, almost an hour before I had to leave, and I got some writing done, Spencer. Okay. It was only like four or five hundred words before work, but that actually carried over. So while I was working in between, you know, my delivery stops, I was fucking knocking out some more words. Okay. Instead of like, you know, I'm just going to fucking check Facebook for a minute. I'm just going to see how many reels I can watch before my next stop. No, I just, I got right. So I probably did about 800 words today. And then, before you came over, I was down here on the laptop. Yeah. Knocking out another scene, and then... As you you yeah, witnessed, as, as Mindy I walked uh, into Mindy called me upstairs because it was time to inst. It wasn't time. I was going to do it this weekend, but she decided she wanted to install a new faucet in the sink. You, can, you know, kitchen sink, and you know how that goes. As you've been sitting down here for two hours <laughs> waiting for me to. Normally, our podcast is over twenty minutes before this yeah. even, <laughs> has even started. Uh, so that was a pain in the ass. But going back to the reading, because I want to ramble a little more. I, uh, as you also saw. I picked up the complete Omnibus Conan collection with the original uh, Weird Tale style, like, you know, how they were originally printed, and by order day, because the one we had was just, like, a first volume. Uh, I picked uh, that up. I picked up a Raymond Chandler, his short story collection, the complete short stories of Raymond Chandler. I'm excited to read that. And I picked up Solomon Kane by Robert E. Howard, the whole collection of those. And I started reading, that's what I was reading last night and a little bit today. So I probably knocked out... Uh, a little over 100 pages, so maybe four or five stories, and I'm really liking it. Yeah. It's, uh, cause it's like Conan with the adventuring thing, but like Solomon Kane is more of a, I, I don't know, like, whereas Conan was just like, I'm gonna cleave you in the head and drink yeah. mead, this guy has more thought into what he does, but he still just kills everybody. It's like, it's more, uh, thought out and planned, mm-hmm. I would imagine. It's almost like he's... And doesn't uh, he get... Does he mess around with sorcery, or is he like... No, but everything so far he's come up against is a bunch of sorcerers okay. and wizards. and like. Well, also, I didn't know this, because I didn't read too much into Solomon Kane. A lot of horror. Like, it's it's like... So far, these stories are like horror stories with uh, adventure twist, which is fun. And Solomon Kane is kind of like if you had a reverend who just killed everybody. Because he's a Puritan, but... It's not really like he's religious. He just, at least so far, he just has, um, I guess you could say, like, like a moral uh, quest, almost. It's when he thinks, like, he explains at some point, whenever he sees something unjust or immoral, like some, like, one girl, she got uh, violated and then uh, murdered by uh, a bandit, 
So he just goes out. He goes all across the world chasing this bandit just for no reason. He didn't even know this chick just because it was an injustice that he felt a right that needed wrong, you know, a wrong that needed righted. So I like that. I can get down with that. And he has a really stupid haircut. Yeah, isn't he, he like like super pale too? He's really pale and he's gaunt. He's strong, lean, and gaunt. And I like a hero that looks like a villain. <laughs> like he looks <laughs> yeah. like he's he'll, uh, heroes aren't supposed to be gaunt. I think that's why I didn't catch on uh, so much. Now, is there any like? Like racial overtones in in these stories, like in the in the Conan stuff. Well, yeah, because the last story was about um, and I'm not gonna say the words, but <laughs> it was an island of Africans. Ooh. Uh, so there was a lot of like apes, like descriptions of like ape like people. Though the one guy that was the main culprit here, like he was the one that was really compared to a gorilla. His he was the gorilla slayer. Yeah. So kind of was okay, I guess, for that part. But I will say in the intro, because I there's a Ford. Uh, no, it was like the obituary, not obituary. What is it when somebody uh when you die and somebody writes a nice thing about you? What do they call that? Memorand memoriam or something? Memorial, something like that. Whatever it is, H.P. Lovecraft wrote it. You know. What he and one thing that stuck out to me said in there was how uh, Robert E. Howard was about civil rights and equality for everyone, huh. which I I didn't think just because like H.P. Lovecraft was super racist. I would, and you know we read the Conan stories and they had, but remember when and when we did those episodes we discussed like well how much of the editor yeah. added to because that's another thing Lovecraft kind of talked about was uh, how the editors changed his Robert E. Howard's work. So what if they added some of the racial overtones? Because so far these stories, which weren't as popular, and they came out before I think, then before the Conan stories, like even what we, we might still consider racist now, like you could see how a writer back then would just think it was just like p- nicely describing like yeah. black people or Africans or something like that. Uh, and he did give like you know them like powers and stuff too. It wasn't just like they were like subservient idiots, like how you'd see a lot of. Uh, Old timey writers write about stuff like that, so it was interesting so far. I'm I'm looking forward to checking uh checking out the rest of the stories. I only got three or four hundred more pages to go. What about you, good sir? Any writing? No. And we'll end on that. Hola, senors and senoritas. Si. <laughs> um, <laughs> Senor. I also, I don't know why I said and. And is an and in Spanish. It's E. Uh, y. It's letter Y, but it's pronounced E. Um, this is the Drunken Pen Writing Podcast. Not the... Uh, how do you say drunken in Spanish? I want to be the drunken... I was just going to say you should try one time doing the whole open in, uh, yeah. in Spanish. Be the drunken boligrafo... Uh, I don't know how you say podcast. You, podcast uh, I don't think pod, podcast would be a loan word, so I don't think there's a Spanish version of that. Who am I? I'm Caleb James, the host, the uh, one you come to listen to, and the guy that you want to see but you never get to. Actually, you can't even go on our Instagram. He just has a fresh picture up on uh, the Drunken Pen Writing. What is it? At Drunken Pen Writing. At Drunken. On at Instagram. Drunken pen writing. Spencer, the Nigerian nuisance church. I was going to give you Nigerian nightmare, but that's a UFC fighter. So, yeah. So you don't need to be the you're yeah. the nuisance, which makes more sense. Yeah, I mean, honestly. yeah. I'm just a mild nuisance. Mild nuisance. Uh, today's episode: three reasons why your work isn't getting out of the slush pile. I don't think we've covered this one, so we're gonna do it now because uh, this is something that all writers who submit work struggle with, I believe, because I know I have. It is a real pain in the ass. For many writers, submitting work, such as short stories, to various publications is a process of growth. Rarely does a writer's work get plucked out of the slush pile while they're first starting out. It'd be nice if you could get, like, score right off the bat. More often than not, new writers are faced with what seems like a never-ending barrage of rejection letters and emails. These If if you're lucky. If you're lucky. These rejections sting at first and might even make you want to give up. But it does get easier over time. Um, I wrote this article in uh, 2018, by the way, so I, I don't feel that way anymore. I feel like it doesn't get easier <laughs> until you get recognized. If you're famous, it's easier. If you have already a bunch of publications to your name, 
and that's in your cover letter. I think that's what a lot of these magazines go for because they want the views. Who's yeah. going to bring the views? Unknown writer who writes excellently or James Patterson who might write or not even write his own work. And he has a shit story, but he wants to submit it to fucking the New York or something. Who do you think they're going to go for? James Patterson, because he sells books. Patterson. patter fucking sin. This stage of writing helps you build character as well as your author's voice, though it's still a very daunting process, and at some point it might seem like you'll never get published. Well, I'll be honest with you, there's a chance you might never get published. Your work can get rejected for numerous reasons, but I'm going to give you the top three. Hopefully after reading this, you'll f- you find folks can make some tweaks to your work and finally break through to the other side. Let's go. And I got a picture that just says go. Woo. I love Number three, you don't follow the publisher's fucking guidelines. Fucking's not in the title. I added that. Yeah. Because this is why I reject 90% of the DPW submissions. You don't follow the guidelines at all. And it's not like we have, like, difficult guidelines, right? Our like, guidelines they're- are fairly basic. They're very easy to follow. And uh, I'm lenient, too. So if me or you or Ash or somebody, you know, reading somebody's submission, and we look and, like, maybe they missed one of them. Like, uh, maybe they didn't put whatever, pro- like, we have Halloween submissions in the email title, so, you know, the subject of the email. Maybe they forgot to do that and they just put submission. I can let that slide, but I've had submissions where it's literally, here's a story, and that's it. They just, one sentence, didn't tell me, about, you know, no biography, no word count. Oh, oh! I just want to be like, why the fuck did you bother you wrote a 10,000 word story, which usually is another failure because our limit's never 10,000 yeah, words. Right. It's usually like 5,000 at max. That's a lot. But I've had people submit 10, 15, 20, a whole fucking novella, and then they're just, they don't, they just ignore the guidelines. They don't read them. They just read, oh, the submit Halloween submissions, and then they just submit. Like, uh, why would you want to submit something like that to a website that you're not getting anything from? Well, like, the, you know what I mean? It's not like we're paying, yeah. like, you know, for for work or, or anything like that. Desperation, I would imagine, if you're submitting something that time-consuming to write to such a, you know, publication. And also, if you are going to submit to a publisher, and this might be on the list, obviously know the guidelines, but maybe read the fucking website or magazine you're submitting to. Yeah. Like, get familiar with the publication. I don't understand why people don't do that. I'm sure that's on here, so let's just stick with this one first. This should be common sense. Follow the damn guidelines of the publication you're submitting to if you want someone to actually read your work. And I don't mean kind of follow the guidelines or add some extra things to, to your cover letter to show what a quirky and unique person you are. If the guidelines say give a brief bio, keep that fucker brief. Yeah. They're not going to read your whole life story. I know I don't. I get irritated. Yeah. Like I've had, uh, I have had. remember one guy specifically. He went on and on about all his educational achievements and job achievement that had nothing to do with writing, and I did not care at all. If the guidelines say to keep your story above and or under a certain word count, do exactly that. The first thing most publications do when sorting through submissions is weed out those idiots who don't follow the submission guidelines. What's the point of going to the trouble of submitting work and maybe even paying a submission fee just to blow it by not doing the simple things the publisher asked of you? I'm telling you straight up, put your ego aside and follow the submission guidelines 100%. And before submitting, make sure you double, triple, and quadruple check that you did everything correctly. Don't get rejected before your work even gets read. That is like the biggest thing. I just don't, I, it just still blows my mind. Like, especially you, people that yeah. pay like $20 for a submission fee somewhere and they didn't follow the guidelines. Ridiculous. Yeah, because you could have the best story out of the bunch, but it's not even going to get read if you don't do the the, the cor- correct steps to get it read. Yeah. You have to have, I mean, a lot of cover letters, they don't even want a real synopsis of the story. They just want a very brief description. Now, if it's now it's different if you're like, trying to get an agent or something for a book because then often they want the beginning, middle, and end of your story. Like, they want to know how this whole story wraps yeah. up. But, like, I'm, we're, I'm mainly going with uh, magazine submissions and different, you know, online publications. So, like, Black Warrior Review or, you know, Cemetery Dance, things like that. Like, th- those would be major publications. Or DPW. Again, we're simple here. We actually read because a lot of, truth be told, especially if you're up doing a submission fee, a lot of magazines probably don't read your work. 
Like, that's just the harsh reality, because if you get, like, a Cemetery Dance where Stephen King's been published many times, you're looking at probably thousands and thousands yeah. upon submissions, maybe even a week. Like, The New Yorker, that's thousands of submissions a week. They're not reading any of those, probably. They're looking for a name, which I'm sure the... You're not going to be in the slush po- pile if you're, like, a Haruki Murakami. You're going right to the editor or whoever, like, hey, here's a story, and they're like, okay. So if you're in the slush pile, to begin with, you're not going to get out with... uh you know, like if you don't follow the guidelines and have like even the most basic of cover letters, like you have to, ha- you have to follow the rules. That's just the main thing. Because they're just, I, I'd have to imagine they're just looking for a way to just be like, all right, how can we get rid of like a shit ton of these stories? So it's we probably don't even a bunch of interns. Yeah, it's probably a bunch of interns who are just getting paid to read all these submissions. And what do they want to do after the first five? Not read any more submissions. Yeah. They're just gonna be like, all right, fucking, oh, yeah, I don't like his name. Like, yeah. <laughs> His last name's Coxwain. That that wouldn't be good. Number two, your work doesn't start off with a bang. This is one we talked about many times just in your work in general. I get it. You're a literary craftsman and your writing is art. Some stories start off with a slow burn and heat up halfway through. This is fine if you're an established writer, but it's not always wise to go this route when you're just starting out. For instance, if you're submitting a short story to a magazine, you need to hook the reader instantly. The sad, dirty truth of the literary publishing world is that most of the people tasked with reading submissions aren't reading the whole things, especially if it's a major publication. They simply don't have the time or manpower to waste on reading every single submission. What they will do, though, is read the first paragraph, or if you're lucky, the first page. They judge your writing style by this small sample and either deem your work to be a dud or worth finishing. So make sure your first paragraph is fucking amazing. Hell, make your first sentence wild if you can. The goal is to hook the reader immediately, because they won't read 10 pages to get to the good parts. As a matter of fact, you should take this advice and apply it to all of your work. Readers just don't have the attention spans or patience anymore to read a few chapters before things heat up. They want that instant gratification. I've had this with many old, like, classic literature, where you might go almost to the halfway point before the book gets real interesting. Yeah, Yeah, before it happens. You can't do that now. Unless your prose is just so immaculate and uh, your metaphors are so beautiful and everything like that, it's art in itself, which is not mo- like 90% of writers aren't doing that. Um, even back when writers were all, you know, like the classic writers, most of them weren't probably doing that all the time. But even, even so, like you just have to, I always say the first sentence, like that's one of the Stephen King's rules, you know, is if you can catch him with that first sentence, but at least the first paragraph or two. You want to have some kind of action or something. Like, I wish I could remember the episode we really covered this, but it doesn't have to be, like, detailed drama. It doesn't have to be an explosion or a gunshot. It's just something that catches the reader's attention, which is something I try to do in all my work is make that first paragraph really pop. Number one, you need to learn to accept feedback. Ooh, I've had some submissions where I've given feedback and got some... Uh, get, get some feedback yourself. Yeah, I got some grouchos. You know, the the this is my favorite. When you give somebody feedback on something and they either just tell you you're wrong or you just don't understand their work. It's like, no, I'm the reader. I I can understand if it's something complicated and maybe I just it did go over my head. But that's never the case with like submissions for horror stories or something. Yeah. It's like, okay, um, you know. This if, part was kind of poorly written, or you're focusing on the wrong thing in your story. If even if say if that guy's correct and you don't understand his writing, that's still a fuck up on his part. Yeah, you're supposed to make it so your reader understands the writing. So yeah, I don't know what people think when it comes to like getting feedback, like why they get so. I mean, I get it. It's like you want to take it personal almost, but it's never personal. Very rarely, unless you're Hunter S. Thompson and you just really flip out on somebody. It's generally not personal when it comes to somebody giving you feedback. Uh, Does it hurt when somebody tells you that your work sucks? Yes. Uh, But if they take the time to actually give you constructive feedback and be like, hey, you know, some of these parts are running on a little too long or your descriptors are going on a little bit too long. Like, take that, you know. And also, it's like, uh, we, you know, as we mentioned before, uh, the... Get feedback by, um, from multiple people so you know, like, if you get ten p, if you get feedback from ten people and, like, seven, seven of them say, like, this part of the story yeah. is kind of wonky or whatever, chances are it probably are. Then, like, if it's, like, one or two, you'd be like, yeah. well, they're just dummies. They don't, like. Yeah, if you go by the law of averages, you have, 
a hundred people read your story and 80 of them are telling you the same thing that's wrong with it, that's, it's wrong. That's just the, you know, that's just what it is. If you get rejected during your literary magazine submission odyssey, and you will, just want to reiterate that, make sure you're learning from the process. The worst thing you can do is keep trying to hammer a square peg in a round hole. Meaning, if your romantic drama about a deaf librarian who gets forced into doing porn to pay for her mom's dialysis treatment has been rejected over 10 times, it's probably time to make some adjustments. Now, I was going to say, that's not a story I, I wrote. That's just a story I want to read. I, I was just going to say, I think you should write that story. <laughs> We were talking about how, you know, we need more stuff for the website. You need to just turn that yeah. into, like, a cereal or something. I mean, that is a noble cause, your mom. You're paying for your mom's dialysis. Come yeah. on. First off, if you're getting the generic, your work isn't what we're looking for right now, emails, your story most likely isn't that good. So take so take things back to the beginning and try something fresh. Um, Looking on this article now, it doesn't even necessarily mean... That your story wasn't that good. They probably uh, just didn't look at it. Uh, they That's usually a generic one where they didn't look at it. Or like when I cover people, uh, if I say something like that in a return email, it's um, either the writing was poor, but usually I give corrections if I feel the person was, at least if they do it through the guidelines properly and they were cordial, I'll try to help them out. I have more time than most edit, like, you know, mainstream publishers, like their editors don't have the time to do that. And again, if you have interns, they're not going to fucking give a shit. Eventually, you'll start to get real rejection emails where a publisher's editor or whomever emails you gives you feedback on your work and tells you why your work wasn't a fit for them. These are good. These you can work with and learn from. The thing is, though, you can't learn from anything if you let your ego get in the way. You must be willing to listen and even accept this feedback. They don't have to tell you how you can improve or what was wrong with your story. If they are doing this, it's because you have something they might want in the future. You're probably on the cusp of getting published, but you have a little bit more to do to get over that hump. Um, and also, sometimes that generic email, maybe, the, like I said, the story is might not be for them, but uh, boring is another one. Or like we said, you might have just not caught them at the beginning. Like that's a, like you said, they probably just didn't read it because they might have read the first paragraph, wasn't that interesting? They just gave up. Or they sometimes they just read the syno the brief synopsis you put, and they're just like, that doesn't. Yeah, I don't really give a shit about that. That's another episode we should do is how to do a proper cover letter. I don't know how many views we'll get on them, but it's actually a very important one because as I get older and you know more established in this field, I realize that a cover letter can make and break a submission, especially to a major uh, publish publication because. If you if you have a poorly written cover letter, what's the odds of your story being well written? Yeah, or yeah. Cover letters are one of those things you don't get as much. Uh, like the details of what makes a good cover letter, they're they're various. You know, according to whatever articles you're reading or things like that. Like they vary. You'll find some common points that you probably want to hit, uh, but they're not like guidelines where it says, "Oh, I just have to do this and this and that." No, the cover letter usually there's more play. Uh, Often magazines will tell you they just want a brief bio and like small cover letter. Some don't have that at all. Uh, so you might be like, well, I don't know, what if I send them a 10 page cover letter? Like it's, those are just things that like, another thing too that always bugs me. Like you go through the submission process. A lot of them have just like the online submission forms or whatever now. So it's like you write, you have to fill out the submission form. And then almost fill out like the exact same thing for a cover letter. It's like, what the fuck was the point of the cut? Why do I have a cover letter? I did it twice. It's irritating. It's like jobs that make you do multiple applications. Like, why? You need an application and a resume. Well, everything yeah. I say in the resume is on the application. Why yeah. do I have to do this? Fucking get rid of that. <laughs> Stupid. It's, a, it's the same thing with different names. Yeah, I hate that. Stupid. So what'd you learn today, Spencer? I learned a lot. Good. You haven't gone through the submission process. Why not? Uh, I don't. Well, We've been guess, talking about you needing to submit to places. You have plenty of stories. You just never get around to doing it. Yeah, I just, well, I guess it's just like, I, I'm not really hip on the scene of of places that are accepting, uh, you know, submissions. and. What um, usually kills me is the time period. I always find out about these submissions too late, and then yeah. I have to, like, rush, because it's usually a specific theme or something. It's not like a story I already have written that I could just submit. That's one main thing that gets me. The other one is if I do already have a story, like I wrote a story that I specifically want to submit to places, I can't find a proper magazine that's a fit for it. Because magazines are very niche now. I notice like it's like crime fiction or noir or, you know, 
hard sci-fi or certain kinds of horror. Like, it's never just like, oh, just a horror story. I'll take that. No, it's like a specific kind of horror. You know, we want a ghost story. It's like, oh, God damn it. I never seem to have the right story for the publication I find that I want to yeah. submit to. Or I find, a, uh, I find something I want to submit to, but I don't have enough time to write a story for it. And that's like that's what happened with that uh, one I'm working on now. I wanted to uh, submit it to that one magazine, and I just didn't have enough. I had nine days, and I just couldn't do it. Um, but maybe now I'm waking up earlier. Maybe. Maybe I'll finally hit my stride two days later. Hey, Gibbs, you wake up early and do some writing? Well, no, the weekend came. and Yeah, I'm not waking up early on the weekend. Like, Ew. Fuck out of here. Like... <laughs> Well, you still had all day to write, didn't you? Well, Saturday I did, but I just, you know, I had to... This horror movies ain't gonna watch themselves, <laughs> Spencer. Right? Old Zelda games that need played. Yeah, those ain't gonna finish themselves. What the fuck? I feel like a loser now. A Why? big time loser. Because now I just go... I wrote that 2018 thinking... I, when we started this Odyssey, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna get published every year. And I just... Again, I had... Like, I haven't submitted to enough places. Usually, I submit to maybe four or five magazines a year. Last year, I didn't even hit that. I think the year before, I might have hit four or five. But my problem is, I have, like, very specific magazines I'd like to get published in, like the bigger magazines. I I never really aimed lower uh, because the word counts and stuff, like, they were going for. But the main thing is, like, a lot of the ones that I know I could just easily get in, they don't fucking pay shit. I don't want to just... Like, if I wrote a 10,000-word story, I'm not going to submit it to a magazine that pays in a free copy of the magazine. Yeah. Like, because then I'm, that's that's getting paid in exposure, basically. It's like, oh, you know, you get to be in the magazine. And then they get the rights to your story as well. So it's like, I can't even publish this somewhere I, else. I think that's also another reason why I haven't dived into the submission as much is because it's like... Now, too, like, do you really need... I mean, yes, it 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 helps with exposure, but, like, how many, like, indie authors do we know that are, you know, assume that have, like, a pretty decent o- audience that probably haven't submitted to, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, they don't so, really have too many publications, you know, to their name or anything. Uh, I mean, I just want to make some money. Yeah. I want to get paid, son. But if you can find a way to... That's why I always aim for the higher magazine. Yeah. Because, you know, one, they pay at least six cents for word, per word. Usually that's like the good going rate. But also, if you get published in the, like, you know, like a Cemetery Dance, for instance, or Black Warrior Review, well, that's like a major publication. So, you know, you can put that on the old resume. You yeah. can be like, yeah, I got published in this. And people are like, oh, shit, I know what that is. Like, that's yeah, that's worthwhile to me. Whereas if it's a smaller press, I don't need the exposure. Like I could just go through DPW like we have been or, you know, someone that's on our tier. There's plenty of different magazines and stuff on our tier that I could submit to. And again, though, like we don't pay like we just we try to do up your story. And then like the way we do it is unique because we you can publish anywhere. If you have a story published through us. We let you keep all the rights to that. So if you you yeah. email me like, hey, I submitted this to another magazine. They want to buy it, but I can't have it published anymore. Like, hey, I'll take it down. No yeah. problem. I don't care. And that's what off my back. I make sure I do that for all writers. I say, hey, story's yours. We're just we're just showcasing it for you. That's yeah. all we're doing. Because I hate that like other magazines and publications that are on our tier, they like that'd be one thing if they pay, even if it's dog shit, like ten bucks or something. You're still, that's an exchange. Yeah. But when they get it for free, they don't pay you for it, and it's essentially just exposure. Like, they're just going to have you on their website or in their magazine. Usually, it's not a print magazine if you're they're not paying for it. But then also, they get the rights to it, so you can't submit that story anywhere else. You don't own the work. Uh, I think that's kind of the thing. No, that's tacky. Like, what are you doing? That just seems like the... Public the publication is kind of lazy in that they don't want to have to go back and remove the it's, work for somebody. It's bad for the industry. Yeah, it's not author friendly. I mean, I get why people do it because it makes the press seem like they're more important than they are. Like if DPW is like, "Hey, you published through us, we own this work," or for at least a year. Usually, that's what it is. Like a year, or we get the first right, you know, the first world rights for like a year or something. But if I was just like, "Hey, we get your rights for a year, you can't submit this anywhere else, can't publish this anywhere else, can't even put it on your own," but that's another one. It's, can't put it on your own personal blog. Like that's if you get published somewhere, usually you can't have that story anywhere online or anywhere that it could be found. So I don't want to do that. 
Like, if somebody wants to put it on their uh, wet pad or something, go for it. I don't care. Have it as many places as you c- can, if, you know, yeah. many readers as you can. We're reader friendly. That's the whole point of this. I never understood the whole, like, mine. I, I bought it, and it's mine, and nobody else can read Because that's why movies and stuff get fucked up due to licensing. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, Sony owns this franchise, but they decide they're not going to do any more movies in it, and they're just going to hold on to the license so nobody else can do anything with it. I hate that. That grinds then, my gears. And just wait till the last the last possible min- minute, shit out a shitty version so of it. So they can keep the rights. Yeah, and then not do anything for, for with it for a couple uh, years. There's so many where it comes to comics, movies, books. Like There's so many products out there that you just can't have just because some selfish fuck. Or just like, um, just weird, uh, publishing things anyways, like, uh, with, uh, Nicholas Oberon's like uh books like mm-hmm. uh there for a while like we couldn't get any print print editions at all and like now like they don't have like the third book in Kindle or at least I don't think or we couldn't he get had them the into- first two books as a U.S. contract but the third one was just U.K. for some reason uh I think the first one was U.S. and U.K. and stuff but the third one was just U.K. only. So we couldn't just we couldn't get it over yeah. here properly. Like yeah, it was stupid. Like we had to buy it from Europe. Yeah. It's like come on. Uh, and then then I don't think there was a print copy for a long time or something. Uh, it's really annoying. Like I saw this thing about uh, not, it's gonna, I'm gonna kick myself. I can't remember the game. It was like an old school RPG that was really popular, and they were uh, like fans have been wanting either a second one or them to redo it. You know, with modern technology for a long time. I think they wanted it in 3D or something. Like N64 type of deal. And uh, the company, they just weren't going to do it. So, like, just an indie game maker, he, him and his team got together and they did it. They, they just made this fucking awesome, like, started making this awesome game and putting out the project, you know, so the fans could watch, see how they do it. And everyone was real excited. Everybody gets to play this game. And then they ended up shutting it down before it got completed because the company was like, you know, cease and desist. This is our product. It's our license. You can't do anything with it. We're not going to do anything with it, but you can't do anything with it. Nobody gets to enjoy this. Yeah. It's like, you guys are fucking dickheads. I hate that. Well, for um for years, Marvel didn't put out a Fantastic Four book because Fox uh, had the movie rights, and they were doing, like, a bad job, and they were not... So they, they didn't... Because with, with, you know, Marvel being owned by Disney, they didn't want to give... Fox any kind of like free promotion yeah. by having Fantastic Four comics. So like it didn't punish them, they just get rid of the comics. Like it's just like that what the fuck? That makes no sense. Why do you have to do this? It's it's so stupid. It just hurts everybody. See, this is where I get my, my integrity from Spencer is like and you hear some artists like Banksy I think he fucking still gets money from his work somehow, even though nobody knows who who he is, but like some artists will paint things, and they won't sell it purposely. They'll just give it away or something. They just want people to have the art. Usually it's rich people that could do that. Most yeah. poor people, you know, you're struggling. But I always thought, like, if I was ever a rich guy, or even like a Stephen King-level author, maybe not famous-wise, but money-wise, where at least once I made it, I would I would be fine putting out books for free. Yeah. Like, like, if I wrote a book and just have it, like, if I was already million, like, I didn't need any more money. Why would it hurt just to give a book, you know, for people for free? Like, or at least the the ebook well, version for free. Like, a really, like, like whatever the lowest price it is yeah. to cover the cost of making the books or whatever. Yeah, you know? I mean, yeah, that, a dollar or two or something. I, I, because should books really be, like, 30 bucks? No, probably not. Uh, unless they're, like, really cool editions or something. And, you know, like, the leather-bound. Yeah. Like, that's understandable, but if they're just, uh... Like, how many Penguin paperbacks we see for $20 for, like, a 80-year-old book? It's like, come on. And it's not even big. And it's shit quality, and the paper's almost see-through. Like, really? 100 pages for this? Like, Joseph Conrad, fucking Heart of Darkness will cost you 20 bucks? Like, no. See, that, that. That's, at least that's one good thing about the um the H.G. Ware stories that I've been picking up. They've all been under, they've all been like eight or nine bucks at the most. Right. Because they're all shorter, like a hundred. I think maybe Wards, Ward of the Woods has been the longest one so far. I think that one might be close to like 200 pages. Like, that's not too bad. Well, we should wrap this up. Because I'm just going to start ranting about things now. If you like this episode, give us some star ratings, huh? Or a review. 
I don't know what I know we're like Apple Podcasts you can review us. I think on different uh I think most podcast apps have their own rating. They, they gotta have something yeah, if, or just get the word out, just tell your friends, you know, that always helps. I always forget to like I don't I don't like to be that dude, just be like, hey, you know, tell like and share and smash that like button. But, you know, it, it does help. It gives more listeners, and uh, well, some mean, people might find it helpful. Well, I mean, that's even, like, on social media whenever, like, on the new episodes come out and, like, the, you know, social media page. I share those, but I don't I'm but, like, I don't ever say I'm not like, hey, the new podcast that I'm yeah. in or anything. It's just like, no, it's just a new episode of, you yeah. know, of a podcast that you could, you know, most people probably think it's just, like, a podcast that I listen to that I like, you know? Right, yeah. That's a good move, actually. Speaking of social media, if you want to follow us on the old socials, you can check us out on Twitter at Drunk Pen Writing, Instagram and Facebook at Drunken Pen Writing, and uh, the website, drunkenpenwriting.com, and Snapchat at BonerPill96. See, 69 was taken. I, yeah. You, you didn't think BonerPill69 would be taken, but it was, so I had to go 96. Is that just like, a, is that just standing up? Ass to ass? Ass to back ahead? Ooh. That's... I'm not sure. I'm not... I can't picture the... Nine... Six... Sounds like ass to back ahead. <laughs> it's weird. I don't know how that... I don't know if anybody likes doing that. Anyway... I'm, I'm sure there's someone. <laughs> someone probably does. Thank you all for listening. We appreciate your downloads. Oh, yeah.